Welcome back, Bit Squad, to the channel today. I've got a very special episode, episode 18, actually, of my podcast, Beards and Bitcoins. If you guys aren't following us, you can get it on iTunes or Spotify or SoundCloud or all of the various uh, listening platforms. But a couple days after we do the audio version, we do release it here to YouTube. So this is a very exciting interview with Mark Moss from Market Disruptors and Signals Profits. And let me tell you, this is a phenomenal episode. I got so much out of this episode, not just as the host, but as an interviewer, as, as getting to talk to Mark and gain his insight on life, investing, and trading, and all the good things he had to offer. I felt like I walked away from this podcast probably getting as much out of it as you guys are going to get out of it. So I really, really enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. I think this was our best episode yet. So without further ado, here is episode 18 of Beards and Bitcoins. Welcome back to your newest favorite podcast, Beards and Bitcoins, where BitBoy and J-Chains get together each week to talk about crypto and things happening in the community. They will bring you some special guests and giveaways, so make sure you're subscribed. For all show-related news, you can find the guys on various social media outlets. Everything is listed on the official show Twitter account, at Beards Bitcoins. Now, without further introduction, two dudes that have beards, like Bitcoins, and want to talk to you about both, BitBoy and J-Chains. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to your favorite podcast, Beards and Bitcoins. We are on episode number 18. We got a special guest with us today. We're excited about. We'll talk about that here in just a second. I am your co-host Bitboy. That is your other co-host Jay Chains. How are you doing, man? What is up, man? I'm doing well. It's been a great week here in Texas. I hope you have had a great week in Atlanta. Oh yeah, ATL. Yeah. It was definitely a good, definitely a good week here. Uh, it actually was cold this morning uh, for the first time in several days. So, uh, but we it's are all so relative. We got a bunch of Southern boys in the. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right if you're, listen, if, if you're listening from up north don't uh, don't hate on us but uh quick shout out to our uh, show sponsor huddle fuel you can find them on twitter at huddle fuel or on the web huddlefuel.com make sure that you drop that promo code beards bitcoins because that will save you 10 percent on some pretty darn good coffee oh yeah well oh, i love coffee <laughs> who, who, who doesn't right you know right um, well, and we're also a uh, special announcement. We've got Nick from Huddle Fuel and Adam from Bit Ninja Supply are both going to be on the podcast later this month. So you guys be watching out for that. So you guys will get to hear a little bit for, uh, straight from the source of the coffee. But today we are so glad to be joined by my friend Mark Moss, uh, a.k.a. Market Disruptors. Uh, he's from Signal Profits. He's doing a lot of stuff in the space. Uh, good friend. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing awesome. Doing awesome. Just stoked to be here with you guys. Love uh, just discussing these things. Yeah, it's, nice. it's fun. It's fun. So, uh, yeah. So, Justin, I think uh, you want to talk about maybe some winners, maybe some Twitter shout outs, something oh, going on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, uh, let's let's move on to the next segment really quick. We're going to do the, uh, the Monarch Token crypto Twitter shout out. Uh, you can find these guys on uh, on the web at monarchtarkin.io, excuse me. Uh, and on Twitter at Monarch Token, um, it's crypto wallet. It's pretty much any ERC twenty token you can imagine, plus all the main ones uh, loaded in there. Pretty cool, uh, pretty cool features. And uh, I know they'll be coming out with some uh, some updates and some other things coming soon. So stay tuned, and you know we'll we'll kind of stick with those guys and drop some updates as things happen. So Monarch, check it out. Yeah, I was I was actually on a on a podcast uh, as a, for a guest spot yesterday, uh, Bitcoin Roundtable. So you guys be looking for my guest appearance on there. And uh, we were talking about adoption and, you know, kind of how we're able to spend our cryptocurrency down the road and stuff like that. And I started talking about Monarch Token. I realized, like, every time I talk about it, it almost sounds like a commercial because, like, I believe in it so much, you know. I had to be like, wait, guys, I'm not, like, officially sponsored by them, and this is not a commercial, but I really like what they're doing. So uh, big shout-out to Monarch. Big shout-out. So for the uh, the crypto Twitter uh, Monarch Token shout-out, Mark, who would you like to shout-out this week? Um, I would love to shout out to uh, one of the best technical analysts in the space who's really been uh, calling it uh, good the last couple of weeks. And that is uh, no other than Jacob from I Love Crypto. You got to check him out. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about starting my own fan page just called I Love Jacob. <laughs> Has, ha, hashtag Team Jacob, right? Hashtag. And go, kicking back to the Twilight days. 
There you go. What about you, Bit Boy? What uh, what are you throwing at us this week? Yeah, so I'm actually going to shout out somebody that I don't really even know. Um, I, I but you know we we did have a, a small Twitter exchange uh, recently. A chart that he posted, um, I found it very very useful. It was basically like talking about uh, this. If we are in accumulation stage right now, possibly kind of looking at the chart, comparing it to the last accumulation stage in the last bear market. Uh, leading into the bull market, which would have been 266 days. I just thought the chart was fascinating. And, and that's kind of something that I've been looking at was for somebody to provide me with some kind of perspective on where we are now compared to where we are were then. And so he's he's got a lot of good trading stuff on his page. Uh, it's at Moon Overlord is the guy who shared it. And uh, I think he's definitely worth a follow. I mean, he probably doesn't need the shout out. He's got a lot of followers already. But uh, he's definitely doing good stuff, and uh, I've been checking out his page a lot. And a big, big shout out to him. Absolutely, good, uh, good stuff coming out from Moon Overlord. Well, for this week, I am going to shout out. Uh, I, I, we just did a huge contest, so my shout out actually is going to go to our eight winners. It was the biggest contest and giveaway that we've done so far since we started this show. We gave away, uh, we were going to give away what five thousand Tron, yep. a couple bags of coffee, and then at the last minute, my man said, "Hey, let's let's get some more people involved." So we did yeah. a surprise bonus, 500 Tron, boom, 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 three people. What's up? What's up? So all of our winners, we got Armando, Crypto Curator. We had uh, Crypto Broski, Crypto Mini, uh, Catfish Crypto. I think Catfish Crypto, that's the second time. He won, some, he won some coffee back in the day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 think, then, I think he won our contest from our Catfish episode. That makes what's, sense. Up with the, what's up with all the animals in crypto? Man, <laughs> I tell you what. It's, it, it's an interesting thing. I, I, like, look, big shout out to everybody that does it. Y'all do your thing. I don't. I don't get it. You know, like you just take the word crypto and you add it before anything, and it becomes an account. You know, like crypto basketball jersey. There's like crypto Donald Trump. There's crypto everything. I. I don't know. Crypto banana. You know. So I, I do. I do like the ones that kind of have the play on the words, like crypto fungus. You know, like yeah. Oh play my. the play on the word. Wow, I'm <laughs> such an idiot. I never got that until just now. <laughs> I thought it was just crypto fungus, you know? Wow. Toe fun, fungus. Wow, I'm, I'm really actually pretty dumb. Wow. Okay. Uh, let's let's edit. Uh, can we edit this out? No, I'm just kidding. We'll leave it in. I'm a man of the people. I get things wrong. Yeah, yeah it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, and then uh, the, the surprise bonus Tron Warners, uh, Astro, Tisher, Crypto Banana, and underscore. Crypto Banana. Astro. Crypto right. Banana. There it is there right go. there. The banana and the fish. Yeah. And also, uh, if you guys are watching on YouTube, then you guys will actually get to see this. Of course, if you follow the podcast, you guys know we released the YouTube video a couple days after we released the audio versions because we want you to listen to the audio versions. It's a podcast, but I do like to post them on my channel. And we are rocking our new Beards and Bitcoins freaking shirts, three-quarter sleeves, sig- oh. three-quarter sleeve sig- signature look of your boy J-Chains, the three-quarter sleeve right. look. Uh, but you guys can actually get these shirts on my website, bitboycrypto.com. And uh, we do have like maybe a, uh, uh, we got a website coming down the road for beers and Bitcoins. But right now, that, that's where you can grab it at or grab them. Yeah, get them, get them on BitBoy's site for now. But pretty soon, there'll be a uh, beersandbitcoins.com site for you to get all the stuff you need. That's right. Because right now, I'm making all the money. I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you guys think if you guys think selling crypto merch is a super lucrative endeavor, then uh, I got some oceanfront property in Arizona to sell you. But uh, so cool. Well, we've done our shout outs. We've done our intros. We've we've talked to our guest. Uh, so, Mark, let's get into the episode. So uh, tell us a little bit. Well, first of all, tell people where they can find you. So, you know, we'll do that at the beginning and the end. And then give us a little bit about how you got into crypto and um, kind of what the goal of your presence in crypto is. Yeah. So. Um, I'll try to keep it brief cause it goes way back. I'm old like that. But, uh, um, so first of all, you can find me. I do, uh, I, I, lo- I love to just give as much education as I can. And I'm going to go into my story and why I try and just give as much education as I can. Uh, you can find me on YouTube at market disruptors. Um, or you can find me on Twitter, um, Instagram and Facebook at number one, Mark Moss. Um, so, so check me out on those at number one, Mark Moss or market disruptors on YouTube. Um, so 
I've been a professional investor for about for over 20 years when I was like 18 years old um, in like 1995, way, way, way back. I, uh, I bought a piece of real estate and in California, we had just come out of like the worst real estate correction we had had from 89 to 92. Mm. So it was kind of right at the bottom of a bear market. Um, and I, and I bought, I bought a piece of real estate just to fix it up and sell it. Um, I was so young. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have any money. I got it zero down. I didn't have money for closing costs or even to fix it up. So I brought a buddy in and we got credit cards and we did all the work ourselves, but I made a bunch of money on that house and, um, I rolled it over, rolled it over, rolled it over, parlayed it. And, uh, a decade later, I'm sitting on like $20 million in real estate. I thought I had done really good. I also um, had done a lot of business stuff. So in 2001, right at the dot com crash, bear market, I started an e-commerce business. You guys talked about e-commerce, but back then, back then there was no such thing as shopping carts. There was no Shopify. Um, as a matter of fact, um, there was no one online to advertise to. So I was actually running ads in magazines, and um, I was the only dot com in the entire magazine at the time. Everybody else was still mail order. If anybody's old wow. enough to remember mail yeah. order, you actually had to cut it out and mail it mm -hmm. in. And I went to these brands and I said, um, hey, I, I built this website and I want to sell your products. And they laughed at me and they just said, ah, no one will ever buy anything online. That's ridiculous. And I said, well, I think they will. And I built the website and they're like, well, we won't even take your money. And so um, I tell you that because I've lived through this, like I've been through a technology cycle before and it kind of makes me a little bit mad because I'd been investing already for a long time. I'm an entrepreneur. I had these businesses, I had the web development business um, and I was investing in Amazon and these internet stocks back in the day, but I didn't really understand what was going on. I didn't understand how investing in a technology cycle is different than any other asset. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to that in a minute, but um, I had my businesses going, I had uh, a couple seven figure business. I had a fortune 500 exit, ended up selling off to a huge company, went bigger into real estate. And then 2008 came and I lost everything. And not only did I lose everything, I ended up millions of dollars in debt. So I went from thinking I was on top of the world. I uh, hit every goal. I'm retired. I'm under 30 years old. I got, you know, all this money. And next thing you know, I'm not only broke, I'm in debt and I don't even know what to do. And, uh, you know, at times like that, you can either uh, run or fight, I guess. Right. And so I just, uh, I decided, you know what, like, I got to figure this out. Like, I got to dig myself out of this hole and I got to make sure this is never going to happen to me again. And so I started really, uh, I started really educating myself. And what happened is I made a bunch of money and I thought I was really good but I didn't have the educational foundation I needed to keep it. And that's why you see, you know, 50 cent made 60 million with vitamin water and then he's bankrupt. Um, Cause you know, you can make a bunch of money, but if you don't have the foundation, you won't keep it. And so that's where I was. I made a bunch of money. I thought I was smart, but I wasn't. And I lost it all. And so I started just pouring into my own education, buying the financial newsletters, studying. And I learned a concept that was really simple. And it was that money is like energy. And what that means is it, it doesn't disappear, it transfers. And so that means when I lost all my money, somebody else received mm. my money. And I was like, kind of mad about that. Like, yeah. And I'm like, and, I, and so I vow, I'm like, this will never happen to me again. I will never do that again. I am going to be on the receiving end next time. I'm going to dedicate my life to figuring out how to be on the receiving end of these wealth transfers. And so uh, for the last decade, I've spent studying every market, uh, a little bit more about me. Uh, uh, my my, my e-commerce business I started was a motocross business. I'm a, I'm a dirt bike racer. I chase big waves all around the world, a little bit of an extreme athlete. So my investing is also extreme. I like to invest in what I call non-traditional assets, stocks, 401ks. I'm not into that. Uh, I like to go invest in gold mines. I like oil and gas fields. Um, and uh, I like cryptocurrencies. Um, so I like non-traditional assets where I think we can get, you know, above market returns. Um, fast forward um, until about 2015, um, I was trying to divert, just like any investor, you wouldn't want to put all your assets into any one asset class. Like I wouldn't put all my money into one stock, right? I would diversify it. And so I was learning this concept, like I don't want my entire life in one country. Like, why do I want all my money in one country? What if something happens to the banking system here? So I like it happened in Cyprus around that time where Cyprus went bankrupt and they actually stole 50% of all the bank mm. deposits. 
And so I was looking at setting up a bank in Hong Kong, a bank in Panama. And I figured, hey, I mean, it's all wire transfers and credit cards anyway. What difference does it make? And those banks are actually way better capitalized than U.S. banks. So I was actually talking with an attorney, setting up a trust in Panama. And then I learned about Bitcoin. And I learned that Bitcoin is basically the same thing. It's a way for me to take money out of the U.S. financial system and put it into a way that can't be seized, stolen, manipulated, et cetera. It was the exact same thing. Yeah. So I was like, okay, perfect. So I started putting money into Bitcoin. And I didn't really think of it as an investment at that time. It was just like, this is like an offshore bank account kind right. of thing. But then I started to learn about, you know, all I started. So there's so many different pieces to Bitcoin. And that's why it's hard for a lot of people to understand. So yeah, there's a technology side, there's a money side, but there's a, there's a political side, there's a philosophical mm. side, there's an economic side, there's all these things. And as I started to learn more about it, and I really learned about how it's a way we can kind of take, we can opt out of the system. Yep. If you're not happy about your money dropping bombs on people in the Middle East, if you're not happy about you know all these things that are happening, then you don't have an option, but we do. Now we can opt out. And so I was like, man, I just, I want to tell everybody I know about this. Like, I want to like, I want everyone to know because I want to usher this revolution. I looked at it as like a revolution and I really wanted to usher that in, right? And, and the best vote is a vote with our money. And so we just opt out of the system. So I really like that. And I really started getting into it. And, uh, and, and so with my past of, of losing everything and having to rebuild myself um, and, and, and being an investor in the internet days, but really missing the boat, I mean, I missed it. And I, and, yeah. and I look back with some regret. I was a little bit too young. I didn't know what I was dealing with, but I do now. And I understand that investing in a technology cycle, there's four phases of adoption. And if you can understand how that works, it holds the key to being successful in this cycle because I've, I've lived it before. And so I just want to educate. I want to teach. I want to share. I want people to understand the revolution. I want, to, under, I want people to understand not what Bitcoin or crypto is. I want them to understand why Bitcoin and crypto is important. And I want them to understand how to use it, how to invest in it, how to make money with it. I think there's this massive wealth transfer coming. I think it's going to be the largest wealth transfer um, that we'll ever see probably in a hundred years. And, uh, I want to be on the right side oh, of that yeah. trend and I want oh, everyone else to be yeah. on the right side of that transfer as well. And so that's, that's what I try and teach. That's yeah. Great, man. Your story, your story, like it got me so excited at like one part <laughs> of it. I'm like, Oh man, I got to get into this thing called crypto. I'm like, Oh shit. I already meant <laughs> <laughs> that was a good. That was a good story. That's a yeah. good way to like tell people about like the adoption and get like someone into it, you know? Well, I, I really like the, the point that you brought up about there's so many different sides to it. And, like I recently was talking to, I've been looking for a house. And so I was talking to a realtor the other day and, um, you know, I was trying to explain to her, like before I was full-time in crypto, I ran a rehab for teenage boys. That's what I did for, I basically been doing that for about 10 years. And that was where my passion was like helping people. And like, it's really hard to explain to people the, the transfer of my passion from doing that because that. Like most people would look at that and be like, oh man, that's such a big thing you were doing, you know? Uh, but I was only able to help like, you know, a, a small amount of people. We had about 10 kids in the program and over years I created a lot of great relationships and it was a really good thing. Uh, but, you know, it's hard to explain the difference between that and like why I'm so passionate about crypto. They're like, yeah, just it's like some kind of geeky, you know, nerdy thing. And I'm just like, no, like you don't understand the revolution that is laying right outside of crypto and you bring up a lot of those points you know the political side to it there's also the 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 wealth you know redistribution side to it um you know there is a the, there's a freedom aspect to it you know that is basically breaking free from the chains that we've been held under for, for a while i make this comparison all the time i feel like the internet is comparable to the printing press and the crypto revolution and removing the middleman and the banks from basically breaking our backs is similar to like when the Protestant Reformation happened and there was no longer the, the control of the Catholic Church over the minds and the money of everybody. And so I, I kind of look at a huge revolution like that that's coming, and it's so weird when I talk to people and they don't see it. I'm like, you can't see that this is coming. You, you don't understand what cryptocurrency is. I try to explain it to you, and they're like, eh, it's a passing fad. And I just don't think they really understand all the stuff that's going on behind the scenes that we see every day. And it's almost like a lot of people are walking on, walking around with these blinders on. And for some reason we've been like the chosen people, I guess you could kind of say that for whatever reason, like our blinders are off and we see it. And it's frustrating when you talk to people and they can't, you know, does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we see it all the time, but 
you know, um, like I said, I started this internet business in 2001 and I went to these brands and I said, I want to sell your products online. And they laughed in my face and told me no one would ever mm -hmm. buy stuff online. So I've been there, man. Yeah. I've been there. I've, I've done that. And uh, it just made me think of this tweet that I just put out uh, the other, yesterday, I think. Um, and I'm just going to pull it up real quick so I can just tell you a couple of points. I don't remember off the top of my head. But I put out this tweet and it was actually like a pretty long thread. Um, and I talked about horses. And uh, they actually had this. Uh, damn it. They actually had this uh, epidemic in the 1850s where they thought at the rate we're going, New York City and London will be under like 50 feet of manure. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they had these. Like, <laughs> no, seriously, it was like this wow. big epidemic. And I and I put a picture of the newspaper on there and all these things. Um, oh, here it is. Okay, here. Uh, so uh, it was 1898 and they had this urban planning committee in New York. And they said in 50 years, every street in London is going to be buried under nine feet of manure. Wow. And it was called the great horse manure crisis of 1894. <laughs> um, and then they, then they, but then they, so then they had the horseless carriage come out. That was like the first car. And they said, the dangers of cars are obvious. I'm reading this quote from yep. the newspaper. There it Stores is. <laughs> of gasoline in the hands of people interested primarily in profit would constitute a fire and explosive hazard of the first rank. Horseless carriages propelled by gasoline might attain speeds of 14 or 20 miles an hour, and the menace Ooh. to our people and the vehicles of this type hurtling through our streets and along roads, poisoning the atmosphere, would call for prompt legislation. I mean, think about this, right? Yeah. And then I'm not going to read the whole thing, but then I went on to – uh, this the the CEO of Microsoft in 2007 mm. quote: "There's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share." Shh. That was the CEO yeah. of, of Microsoft at the time. He's a plugged-in guy. If anybody gets it, Mike, the CEO of Microsoft, and he said, "There's no chance." Then you have here the co-founder of YouTube. He said, Steve Chen said, there's not, there's just not that many videos I want to watch. <laughs> you have, you now have, you have to forcibly remove the phone from your eyes now because you want to watch everything. You have this guy, Ken Olson, president of Digital Equipment Corporation. The president of a massive corporation said, quote, there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. So, you know, what happens is we have this normalcy bias, right? We're so used to the way things are that it's hard for us to yep. envision uh, change. And, and really, nobody can envision the future because what we do is we envision a better version of what we have today. So, um, but really, there, it creates new things that we couldn't ever imagine because we don't have the building blocks for those. And so an example of that was like when the Internet first started coming – there was uh, this famous guy, I forget what his name is, but he had this big thing saying, imagine this day where they think we're going to have these virtual meeting rooms and we're going to buy things online. That's ridiculous. But that was only a, imagine a better version. Nobody could have imagined that my car would be hooked to something called a yep. cloud using something called social media to navigate me around traffic because we didn't have all those building blocks, right? And so um, anyway, everybody, everybody misses it. The closest guys to it miss it. Um, and we don't, you know, I think some of us don't have that normalcy bias or we're able to see past that. And of course, me having gone through the internet before and really missing out on that definitely, definitely sees me, lets me see it a different way. But I don't pretend to know um, where it's going to be. Um, but what I do is I know what signs to look for. It's kind of like if I was given directions to drive somewhere, um, I don't know exactly how to get there, but if I, I, I know when I see each sign, which way I should turn. Yeah. And so understanding how technology cycles adopt and, and move forward, it lets us know what signs to look for and then how to change like our investing thesis. But it's funny because some people aren't like that when they go drive places, you know, like some people, they want to know exactly, you know, like sometimes me and my wife will go somewhere, you know, and I'll be like, ah, I basically know where I'm going. I'll go this way. And I know I can kind of figure it out as I go, but then there's other people that, if they don't have that in their iPhone, which, by the way, does have a huge market share, <laughs> um, but if they don't have in their iPhone knowing exactly where to go, then they, they can't really get there. And, you know, that, I think that's a pretty good metaphor for exactly what you're talking about. You know, some people, they have to see it to be able to conceive the future, you know. But for us, it's kind of like, eh, we're open. You just look at the iPhone, such a great example. We look how much that has changed everything even something as simple as like if you did something really crazy back in 2007 
which is the year the iPhone came out, you were fine. Nobody knew. Now, if you do something crazy, the whole internet is going to see it. And that wasn't even a thing back then. So, um, you know, and, and think about it. That's, that's, that, I mean, like you said, your wife can't even go anywhere without her iPhone giving her directions, like how dependent we are. It's only been out for 10 years. Exactly. Ex 10 years. 100%. And so what I find, especially in crypto, and it's frustrating for me, is that um, everybody, I just think, is expecting way too much way too soon. Because what happens is, as humans, we, we overestimate what can be done in a short amount of time, but we underestimate what can be done in a long period of time. So, hmm. you know, again, being in the early days of the internet, you know, Amazon came out in 97. But in, by 2000 after the internet had been out for 10 years, only 10% of Americans had ever bought anything online. Really, we didn't even have the internet sales picking up till about 2005. And so that's like, you know, a long time later. And, and then like the iPhone's like a perfect example. So, I mean, we're, you know, yeah, Bitcoin's been out for 10 years, but really kind of crypto assets as we know them, decentralized crypto assets have been out for about two years. Um, and so um, I just tell everybody like, man, be patient. Like the, one of the big reasons why the internet took a while to take off is it was too slow. It would never scale. Yeah, you couldn't download any, all these things, right? And I'm like, we're hearing the same thing today. I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah, all those things will be fixed. And right? then you look, and then you look back. I was just having this conversation with somebody yesterday. I can't remember who it was, but we, we were looking back at all of those tech companies that popped, you know, the web van or uh, pets.com or e-toys. But the truth is, those people were way ahead of their time. That's all it was. They were just, they had such great ideas. They were and, good ideas, yeah. It, now, granted, most of those rolled into rolled into Amazon. You know, that's where you get your toys, where you get whatever. But, like, you look at the web van, like, now each, like, Walmart has their own, you know, delivery service. A lot of these places have their own delivery services. It was just ahead of its time because, you know, it, it couldn't see the development. But now, you know, they, they look like geniuses. But, unfortunately... Of course, it went on un went under. So technology so is so crazy. Two, there, there, there's two interesting points right there. So first of all, that's how technology. That's that's one of the phases of a technology adoption cycle, right? So what happens is is a um, uh, little plug. I have a three part video series on Market Disruptors YouTube channel that I go into this in depth. And there's like a PDF guide that has like color illustrations of the four periods. So if you want more, go check that out. Um, but um, basically, what happens is, and we saw this in the automobile industry. There's been five tech revolutions in the last 200 mm. years. We had steam engines, we had railways, uh, you know, we had the automobile in the 1900s. So in the automobile age, that was the new technology at the time. Henry Ford created like the assembly line, the first assembly line. And what happened is within a couple of years, there was like 150 auto manufacturers, but then they all went bankrupt mm. and three remained and they bought all the technology of all the bankrupt ones. Mm. And those three were Ford, Chrysler, and GM. Right. And then the internet age was exactly the same way because all tech cycles follow the same thing. So you had all these internet companies and they all went out of business. And what you just said, Amazon and other companies that made it bought up all that technology super cheap and it consolidated down. And now we're about to see the same thing. We have 2000 crypto assets and a bunch of them aren't going to, most of them aren't going to make it. And the few that will, will gobble up whatever good pieces are there. Yeah. And so that's just one of the ways that these, these, you know, these tech cycles work. Yeah. The other thing, the other thing that I would say from an investor standpoint that you really want to pay attention to is um, you're really looking for um, companies that are doing something different that's native to the technology. So what happens is they're like, um, oh, well, currently we can do this. So um, instead of doing it on the Internet, I'll just put it on the blockchain. Well, that's not new. So we're looking for something that can't be done unless it has the new technology, right? Like Uber, for example, right? Uber had never been done before. There's no way Uber could have ever been done without the internet. And if you were to put $20,000 into Uber in the early rounds, you'd have $20 million today, right? So you're looking for those opportunities that are doing something that couldn't be done if it wasn't for that technology. Yeah. That's there's, crazy. There's gonna be, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see the consolidation. You know, when we, uh, it's funny, we talked to... Um, John McAfee about this and you know he he has said you know let there be as many as doesn't matter right but I think that we kind of disagreed with him about that yeah. where it's like we don't need a million privacy coins give me the top couple right we don't need all we just don't need all these different things that are the same let's consolidate it and then move it forward well think th think about this think about the, I think we can probably all relate to this right it's Christmas time not now but it was recently it was Christmas time 
and you know you got to get gifts for people. And so you you go to the store and you look around and you can't find what you want for somebody, and you always end up right in front of the gift card section. And in front of the gift card section, there will be hundreds. It seems like hundreds. Maybe it's like fifty. I don't know how many, but there's so many different gift cards. They're for different restaurants. They're for different sporting goods plays. There's for you know iTunes, whatever it is. And you sit there and you think like. Okay, well, I want to get this for this person, but, eh, you know, maybe they want something else. And and you end up getting the Visa gift card or the yeah. Amazon or the Amazon gift card because it gives them the ability to use that card to buy, you know, multiple things. And I think that's a great argument for where we look at the cryptocurrency space. Like, do if we had 2000 and everything is tokenized, then it gets so specific the way you have to transfer value from different cryptos back and forth. It just makes sense to have a few of them that are kind of like gift cards. You got Bitcoin, you can spend it at all these places, you know? So yeah. that, oh, I'm, I'm going to create think, Bitcoin gift cards and put them in the, shop, the shooting I, I think I think history history shows us different, right? So um, techno again, all the technology cycles follow this pattern. So what happens is you have this, this rampant, you know, run up and then you have the consolidation. So we had the automobile industry, we had 150 auto manufacturers went down to three, but today we have like 50 or 60. Yeah. Right. In the internet, we had, you know, thousands of internet companies. Then we went down to the big five or six. And today we have thousands, tens of thousands of internet companies. So um, you have the run up because the money gets ahead of the technology. It crashes down. Then the technology slowly catches back up. So I believe that eventually we'll have 10,000 crypto assets. I don't know. We'll have 100,000 crypto assets. I, I, I'm not going to put a number on that today. So we'll have this massive consolidation. But then eventually, you know, 10 years, 20 years down the road, there's going to be tens of thousands of crypto assets. And I, I, I see a vision where, you know, uh, blockchain technology has created this token economy. Everything's tokenized. And um, I believe that this, this, this is a bigger topic uh, that blows a lot of minds. It's hard to get into. I don't know if we want to get into all that right now. But Is it uh, flat, flat, the earth? Economy, flat, flat earth? Yeah. No, just uh, <laughs> it's, it's uh, so, so we've, as adults, we've gone through this indoctrination 12 year indoctrination program and and everything we've learned we think we think money is like dollars mm -hmm. right but i have like i have like a fourth grader and i can tell you that seven and eight year old kids so so money is a representation it's a communication of value yeah it's exactly. value so mm -hmm. you have you have an asset something of value and i want it and so, hey, I want that asset. It's valuable to me. I will offer you my asset. Yes. Okay. Well, now we've said that my asset's worth the same value as your asset. Or, hey, I'll give you my labor. I'll build you that website that you need for your store. Or I'll build a fence for you. So now my labor is communicating value. Or I have dollars. That communicate. So all of those things communicate value. But Pokemon and cards. You know, and we're <laughs> born knowing this, right? Yeah. The six and seven year old kids in elementary are trading lunch items. Yeah. They're trading Pokemon cards. Yep. And we see it in prison, right? They're trading cigarette. Like it's inherent to human nature to know how to trade value. They've even done, you know, there's experiments with chimpanzees mm -hmm. where they learn to trade food for yep. things, right? So, um, but we now all of a sudden think that money is dollars, but it's not true. It's a communication of value and it can be whatever I want it to be. It can be my labor. It can be at whatever. So what we have is we have this tokenized economy and with like, you know, projects like today, like storage or Filecoin, I can tokenize my unused hard drive space. Yeah. I can tokenize my um, extra bandwidth with OMG. I could tokenize my airline reward points or whatever. So uh, already we're seeing, you know, real estate be tokenized. Um, we're going to have all the stocks tokenized. Right. And I, I see this vision where money as we know it is kind of forever changed. And everything is tokenized. And just like the six-year-old kids at school or the prisoners, we're just trading assets in real time. Just We're just trading value. And, and through the technology of these exchanges and, and the token economy, everything can just move seamlessly. So it's like a, it's like a supercharged barter system, if you will. Yeah. And so Phenomenal. I think money will always be there, but it will become like a small subset. Like maybe we'll use it for 10 or 20% of our transactions, but most of it is we're just exchanging value. Yeah, and oh. <laughs> whoa, mind blown, you know. Yeah. And before the internet, that wasn't really possible, you know. I mean, we'd moved to a place where, you know, that that wasn't possible because you're limited by your geographic location. But now we're not, and so you know it makes sense. So basically, what you're saying is that John McAfee's right, and we're right. In the short term, there will be a consolidation, and we will see projects fail. 
But then if yep. we were to forecast maybe 10 to 15 years down the road, then we will probably have this fully thriving, uh, you know, totally tokenized economy. And that's very interesting. I think I, yep. I, I, I can vibe with that. I think I think also you have to look at like what fail means, right? So like everybody's thinking, oh, we still need capitulation and oh, we still need to wash out all these scam coins or whatever. But like they're not going to just go away. Right. I mean, Bit BitConnect is still traded for like 16 cents. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> BitConnect is still there, right? So like I think it's like, you know, they're going to fail, but like they're not necessarily just going to go away. So we kind of have to think about it like that. But I think you're right. Yeah, like that point you made, right? You're right. And McAfee's right. We're going to have a consolidation for sure. But then 10, 15 years down the road, it's going to be, I mean, just think about all the stocks, every every equity will be tokenized. There's going to be tens of thousands right there. Now, I want to ask you this, because that's an idea that I've been seeing a lot, that uh, stocks are going to be tokenized. What kind of effect would stocks being tokenized have on the cryptocurrency markets? Um, none, really. That's so. That's I mean, I, 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 I guess, I, I guess, I, I, uh, so when you say the cryptocurrency market, I don't, I don't know what you really mean by that. Like the market. Like if I put, it, like, yeah, yeah. If I pull up I coin, like Bitcoin, if, if I pull up, uh, w basically, just does it? Will it affect? Because there's still stocks. Will it affect the actual dollars in the crypto market? This is where things for me, like me personally, not coming from a financial background. You know, just a person that's passionate about decentralization and have jumped in the community, and I love it. Um, you know, I I don't understand necessarily the logistics of the difference between the stock world and the crypto world, and when you know stocks get tokenized, does that have anything to do with the actual crypto market cap? And you're saying that that won't, but it, but it probably would have an indirect effect. Well, I mean, if if coin market cap puts it into their listing and it's in part of the coin market cap into the market cap, then it does. Yeah. But d d just because they add Facebook and Google into coin market cap and now the market cap goes up to a trillion dollars, does that mean Bitcoin and Ethereum go up? Not really, right? Gotcha. So they're independent of each other. Um, but I think you know the stock market and and the and the and the, and the coins they're they're very similar in a sense where um, they're traded in real time. Um, the price is constantly finding equilibrium between buyers and sellers. Um, the difference is that, you know, with cryptocurrency, it's freely traded. And so that's a, that's a really big difference. So there's, there's this global marketplace where we can constantly trade. But with stocks, there's one exchange. But NYSE, right? You, you don't you don't foresee it. that that changing though, because that's no, that's, I do, I do. So yeah. so these so we've already seen over the last like five ten years, we had like ten thousand publicly traded companies, mm -hmm. and today we're down to about five. So we've already wow. seen a massive drawdown on companies that go public that are on Nasdaq and NYSE. Right. So we've already seen a massive drawdown, and there's reasons. So part of the reason is because the you know the regulations are so bad that like people just start like over it. Um, and then a lot of people are just going like the private route. So a lot of those companies will not go listed the regular way and they're going to go to a security offering and it's still going to be a stock. It's still owning shares of Microsoft, but now I have it as a token. But the difference is now I can trade tokens on the lunchroom table with anybody. Mm -hmm. You got a wallet here. Let me send you Microsoft. And that changes the market because now mm -hmm. instead of like, I can only do it on the NYSE and they're only open six hours a day, five days a week, closed for holidays. Now it's like a crypto asset. So it'll change it from that perspective. Well, I, I have so many questions. I feel like most of, you know, most of the time we get people on the show and we're like bantering back and forth and it's good. And, uh, you know, sorry, the, 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 the audience, <laughs> no, it's, man, it's been the, good. The, the audience is learning something, but we're like, oh yeah, we know this guy, you know, we know what's going on. But man, I feel like I'm learning so much right now and I've got so many questions. Um, so but, I want to, I want to, I want to ask you this question about STOs. So once you have the STO, and you were talking about you can transact it back and forth with wallets. But my understanding from what I've seen with STOs that have already been out is that to actually be be part of the, I guess, investing round, you have to be, a, a what do they call it? A, not a verified investor. Accredited. An accredited right. investor, which means I think you have to have at least $100,000 or, or so, something similar. $300,000 a year, a million dollars of net assets, not including your home. Um, so you're basically in the 1%. Right? right. So you have to be a one percenter to do that, to be accredited. However, um, there's different requirements. So there's like a reg A plus there's a reg A and there's a reg D. So like uh, reg A is like under the jobs act. So that's like crowdfunding, like Kickstarter. So like I could do like a reg A plus and, and I'm not, uh, I don't want to confuse these. I'm not hundred percent, but, um, you, I think on like a reg A plus I could raise up to like a million dollars. 
and then um, and there's like no rest- completely non accredited. Um, so there's there's definitely room, and then and then I can go I think to a Reg D. Um, don't butcher me if I'm wrong. I'm not a securities attorney, but uh, I think <laughs> a Reg D I can go up to like 50 million a year um, of non accredited investors. So there is there is ways for non accredited investors to get into the companies. Just have to do it the right mm-hmm. way. Um, and uh, not that I'm a fan of it. I think the whole credited thing is, is a big scam, right. but um, there is ways for people to do it without having to get that um, um, accredited investor in. Well, one of the one of the biggest, I believe, reggae investors ever was Bob Marley. We jam in, man. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I love Uncle I Bob. I knew something I, like that was coming from you. Man. How did you, you know? know? One thing, you know, so I my my whole thing is like I always try and talk about not what is Bitcoin, I talk about why. Yeah. Right. So if everyone's gonna tell you, oh, Bitcoin's slow, Bitcoin can't scale. So okay. So why would I use it even though it sucks? Well, because it's it's better in some areas, right? It's yeah. censorship resistant, it's immutable. So I'll take the slower speed to have the immutability, right? So then you have to look at stocks. Stocks are fine. Why would we need to tokenize them? No, they're not fine. You don't understand why, right? So the way stocks work, I'm gonna, I'll just give you a real skim on this, is, uh, is ridiculous. So basically, um, I have to buy stocks of Facebook or whatever through an, a brokerage account like E-Trade or Charles Schwab. So when I buy them, I don't own those shares. Charles Schwab puts a thing on their ledger that I'm yeah. owed share, but they don't have the shares. Yeah, you don't they're own them, the right. And then someone owes those shares and those shares. And there could be five or 10 people in that chain that all are owed shares that eventually maybe get to me. And what happens is, as you can imagine, this is a huge inefficient system. Imagine trying to keep up 10 ledgers. It's never good. But it was famous in this Dole Foods case where Dole was going to go private. And what they found is when they did all the records is that there was actually 33% more people that said they owned Dole shares than there were actually yep. Dole shares. And so they, 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 they dilute the stock. And like, how simple would it be if a company could just go public, send me a token, mm-hmm. I own it, it can't be duplicated, it's not, you know, it can't be censored and like, it's just one-on-one and I can just trade this stock with you. Like, how ridiculous is this stock system? Now, of course, you know, when it happened in the 20s, they didn't have a better way to do it. Right. But we have a better way mm-hmm. today and, and so we should do that. So that's, that's the why security tokens um, just to go into that. Sorry. Yeah. I'm just mesmerized, man. I feel like I was in a, a class today. This was amazing. You, know, you said you wanted to do entertainment or uh, not. No, I do entertainment. You want to do education. I do edutainment. You do education. I feel like I have been educated fully. Yeah, I don't, and my, 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 my channel is super boring because all I do is <laughs> teach, teach. No, I mean, that's good, man, because people got to learn this stuff. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, we're, I'm in this every day, but you, everything that I heard from you, man, it's like new stuff. Well, there, you know, there, there's just some things, there's some intricacies to this that the common person in crypto, which me and Jay Chains, we're common people, you know, dudes, we, dudes, we, man. We, we're just beards and Bitcoins over here. Like, there, you know, there's like, there's like other topics too, where like, uh, you know, like a big one that we're battling in the U.S. right now. So, so a lot of people in the U.S., like we have this bias because like I'm in the United States, like, oh, my government's good. My, my banks are good. Um. And so like Bitcoin, we can have a right to privacy, but like people in the U.S. are like, why do I need privacy? Like I have nothing to hide. I need no privacy. Yeah, well, that's did- in the U.S. Well, first of all, I would argue with that. But second of all, if you're in like Iran or like Afghanistan, you have a whole different thought about that. Right. And so we have to remember this is a global thing. And so just because you're in the U.S. and you don't see it doesn't mean the rest of the world's not affected by that. And so that's what I think is important, too. And so like I have a video dropping tomorrow on market disruptors and it's about trust. And I'm talking about Bitcoin is trustless. I'm sure you guys have heard that. But before we go into that, I have to say, what is trust? Why is trust important in society? What happens to a society when trust breaks down? Who do we trust today? The institutions, the banks, Facebook. How has Facebook failed us? How has Wells Fargo failed us? And now Bitcoin is the solution to give us a trustless environment. So you kind of have to tell people why. And it's kind of like philosophy. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a philosophical debate. Why do we need privacy? We don't need privacy. Yes, we do, right? Um, well, so. I tell I, I tell my audience, you know, there, there's definitely a segment of the population that wants privacy because they are trying to do underhanded things. Like that's a segment, you know, that exists for sure. But the, for the rest of us, you know, it's like you get in this mindset of thinking like, oh, well, I don't really care who sees what. Uh, however, what's illegal today or what is legal today may be illegal tomorrow. 
And it might be something, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a church that you go to, or maybe it's, you know, something that you buy, or maybe it's, you know, something today that they don't consider a drug tomorrow. They consider it a drug like caffeine, maybe who knows. And, Um, and, and, and it's not just that, but like our country is so divided today mm -hmm. that, whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, someone's going to be mad on either yep. side you're on. Whether you're Republican or Democrat, if you're if you're a Democrat, Republicans may discriminate. If you're a Republican, Democrat, like no matter which side you take, somebody is going to be on the opposite yep. side. And so you have a right to privacy, but it goes deeper than that. So um, what happens is when I'm worried about someone infringing in my, in my privacy, then I have to start watching what I say and do. Yep. And when I start watching what I say and do, I start changing the way I think. Mm -hmm. And over time, it completely stifles thought, free thought, creativity, originality, because I'm constantly censoring my thoughts. So I censor my actions so I don't get caught. And it'll completely ruin a society. We have to have the right to privacy. And uh, anyway, it's a philosophical debate. Well, awesome. <laughs> Jay changes over there just shaking his head like. Oh. I love, uh, there's, a, there's a quote from uh, Edward Snowden that I really love. And he says that the people that say we don't need a right to privacy because I have nothing to hide, that's like saying I don't need a freedom of speech because I have nothing to say. Yeah. Well, that's a great quote. Um, and I, I, I also have a great quote. Um, I, I think Jay Chains knows a, a, a joke is coming. Um, the famous <laughs> Edward Scissors hands said, "Hey, it's time we got to cut this off." So already, <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been. T- Mark, we th- this has been a phenomenal episode. This is a this is our best episode great. we've done by a long shot. I, I think so. We definitely well, want to. I'm glad I could get on before Pomp then. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so uh, we definitely want to have you back on. Uh, I don't know, may- maybe, and we didn't even get to talk about what I want to talk about with you, <laughs> you know. So um, we definitely want to have you back on. Maybe, maybe in March or April, we can get you back on, and, and we can continue this conversation because I think it's been very enlightening for us. And if it's been enlightening Absolutely. for us, then I know it's been enlightening for our audience for sure. So, um, but thank you so much for for coming on. Um, do you want to tell everybody where where they can find you out one more time? Yeah, again, uh, if you if you like this kind of content, I got tons of it. Um, go to YouTube, search Market Disruptors. I have a I have a, a three part series on this wealth this this technology cycle and how it's a wealth transfer with like a PDF download. So um, if you like if you'd like to learn more how you can learn to use that wealth transfer or that uh, tech cycle, um, check that out. Um, and then on all the socials, number one, Mark Moss. Um, that's it. Dang. You know dang, saying? dang, it's right. That was great, man. I'm, I'm really glad that we had this conversation. And I do look forward to talking to you again, man, because I learned a lot. And I'm ready to learn some more. Well, whenever your uh, next guest, you know, flakes out on you and you guys don't know what to do, just call <laughs> me up because I'm, I'm always I'm always down to have a good conversation. Cool, yeah, man. I love it. Well, Jay Change, you want to uh, send us out, bud? Hey, it's been a fun week. Uh, thanks again to Huddle Fuel. Uh, again, HuddleFuel.com uh, and Monarch, uh, MonarchToken.io. Um, it's been a great week. Thanks again, Mark, for being on the show. BitBoy, see you next week. Later. All right, we'll see you guys. See you. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for listening to Beards and Bitcoins. If you like what you heard, show these guys some love and rate review on SoundCloud or iTunes. Also, remember you can always find the guys on social media. The show Twitter page is at Beards Bitcoins. You'll find direct links to BitBoy and JChains from there. Make sure you check for updates, announcements, and contests. Good luck to all who enter. See you next time.